This is my continuing commentary on Henry Ward Beecher and his sermons, and tonight we're going to talk about Pilate. But before we do, we need to talk about the trial of Jesus. Okay. Here in North America, you bring up the word trial, and this is what a lot of people think about. Oh, there's the prosecuting attorney, and the defense attorney, and there's the 12 jurors, and the nice little judge, and you have the witnesses in an air-conditioned courtroom with lots of video cameras and lots of procedures that take months, if not years, to get done. Let's contrast that with the trial of Jesus. Now, the first thing you have to remember is that the whole area of Judea, mostly the Jewish people, the Jewish people at that time were under the direct control of the Roman Empire. Now that makes a big difference. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But first of all, under Jewish law, if you are accused of a capital crime, you have to be arrested in the daytime. Jesus was arrested at night. So that was the first rule that was broken by the Jewish authorities. They had Jesus arrested at night. Now also remember, the Jewish authorities in themselves could not arrest Jesus. Why? Because they were under the control of the Roman Empire, so it was up to the Roman guards to arrest Jesus. Okay? So, rule number one, they were not supposed to arrest Jesus at night. They did. They broke that rule. And it wasn't the only one they broke. What was rule number two? Rule number two was they couldn't conduct a trial at night. When was Jesus tried? At night. Now the rule broken. They couldn't conduct a trial in a private residence. Whose private residence was it? It was Caiaphas. It was his residence where this trial was conducted. Another rule broken. Now, who was Caiaphas? Caiaphas was the high priest of the Jewish whatever. Okay? If you want to look it up more officially, you can if you want. But Caiaphas had a father named Annas. And Annas was running the operation of the money changers table. Do you see a little conflict of interest here? Mm-hmm. Okay. But it goes on. All right. Now, in this trial, nobody in the Jewish authority brought any legitimate witnesses against Jesus. It just didn't happen. Okay. And even if they had, then the Jewish authorities were supposed to listen to these witnesses, go home, think about what they said, come back and re-interview these legitimate witnesses before rendering their verdict. That wasn't done, so another rule was broken. Now, they were supposed to vote on the guilt or innocence of Jesus, and it was supposed to be done this way. The youngest person of the Jewish court was supposed to vote first, and it was supposed to go from youngest to oldest, so as to keep the older members of the Jewish justice system from influencing the votes of the younger ones. That wasn't done either. So one rule after the next was broken. Now what was Jesus accused of? Blasphemy. That's what he was accused of. Now here's the problem. Blasphemy had nothing to do with Roman law. As a matter of fact, Roman law was pretty tolerant of the Jewish faith. Although they didn't like Jews in Rome, if they stayed where they were supposed to be in Jerusalem, they were, that was okay. Okay? So, blasphemy had very little, if anything, to do with Roman law. Now here's the kick. When the Jewish justice system finally found Jesus guilty of blasphemy, even though he wasn't, okay, they couldn't go up to the Roman authorities and say, Hey, look, this guy's guilty of blasphemy. Kill him. Now remember, they couldn't kill Jesus themselves. Why? Because they were under direct control of the Roman Empire, so therefore they couldn't kill one of their own citizens. 
So they had to come up with a charge that would be enough to cause Pilate, who was in, th in authority at the time, to throw out a death sentence to Jesus. So what did the Jewish authorities come up with? They said, hey, Jesus is guilty of treason. Yep. He's an insurrectionist, too dangerous to live. That's what they told Pilate. Now, the thing is that these Jewish authorities, when they brought Jesus to the judgment hall, the Roman judgment hall, they didn't actually enter the judgment hall because that would defile them. That, now, they had already broken just about every law on their own books. But they couldn't get defiled by walking into a Roman judgment hall, especially on Passover. Isn't that a kick? They're too good to defile themselves in a non-Jewish judgment hall, but they're not too good to break their own laws. There's a kick. So, Pilate gets a hold of Jesus. He drags him in there, has an interview with him. And Pilate immediately determines that Jesus must be some kind of a philosopher like Socrates. Well, you know, maybe he thinks that he's got some kind of a kingdom somewhere, but it has nothing to do with us because he's not raising an army right now to go after us. So really, he's not a treasonous person. He's just a philosopher. So Pilate sends Jesus back to the Jewish authorities and says, Look, I'm not going to kill this guy. He's a philosopher. He's not, a tr he's not an insurrectionist, too dangerous to live. He's just a philosopher. And the Jewish authorities went back to Pilate and said, No, you're going to take Jesus and you're going to kill him. Because if you don't, we're going to go tell your superiors back in Rome, that you wouldn't deal with an insurrectionist. And that's going to put you out of business real quick. But then they said one more thing. These Jewish authorities said one more thing that really turned Pilate. Pilate at that time was having a feud with a guy named Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas was in control of a place called Galilee, which wasn't too far from Jerusalem. When the Jewish authorities said that Jesus was from Galilee and was teaching in Galilee before he started teaching in Jerusalem, Pilate's like, you know what? We're going to end this feud with Herod Antipas. And at the same time, we're going to get this troublemaker off my back and on somebody else's. So, what'd they do? They, Pilate went and sent uh, Jesus to Herod Antipas. Well, this act worked out real good for Pilate, but it didn't really work out real good for Jesus. Herod Antipas gets a hold of Jesus and starts wanting him to put on a magic show. Jesus refuses. So, Herod takes the time to make a literal mockery out of Jesus by putting a purple robe on him and the whole nine yards. Making him a laughable king, basically. So Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate. Now this ends the feud between Pilate and Herod. But it still means that Jesus is back in Pilate's control. And Pilate didn't want anything to do with Jesus at all. So Pilate's like, man, how am I going to get out of this situation? I do not want to kill Jesus but these Jewish authorities, they're going to go over to Rome and tell Rome that I don't deal with insurrectionists and that's going to cause me a lot of trouble. So he thinks, you know, I got a cool idea. It's Passover time. I release a prisoner at Passover time. And you know what? Barabbas is up. So we're going to give the people a choice. They'll either take Barabbas or they'll take Jesus. We all know how that went. Barabbas got free and Jesus was put on the cross. But the last thing Pilate did was he said, look, okay, 
You're going to get your wish. You put the political thumb screws on me, so you're going to get your wish. He's going to get killed. But understand something. I want nothing to do with this. Okay? I'll make sure he dies, but I'm not going to be held responsible for it. As far as I'm concerned, you are killing innocent blood, and I want nothing to do with it. That's why he washed his hands of it. Unfortunately, God didn't see things that way. It's just like they have laws today where if a bartender knows that somebody's drunk and they're going to climb into a car and take off, if the bartender doesn't try to stop the drunkard from going in that car and driving home drunk, then as far as the law is concerned, that bartender is just as guilty of that drunk driving wreck as the drunk driver and can be charged accordingly. That's true in North America. I'm sure it's true in other places as well. Yeah. Let me tell you something. There's this thing called obstructing justice. And if you know a crime is about to be committed and you don't do anything to try to stop it, you're as guilty of the crime as the person who commits it. That's why they call it obstructing justice. And this is also true of school bullying situations. If you don't try to stop the bullying in any shape or form, you're just as guilty as the bully who beats the kid up. That's how you're viewed. In a lot of schools, that's exactly how you're viewed. And you get punished accordingly for that. And in God's eyes, that's exactly how it goes. When Pilate is brought before the great white throne judgment, and Pilate one day will be, God's going to say, why didn't you stop my son from getting killed? And when Pilate can't produce a good answer, there you go. That's the way it works. So, you might want to think about that when you know somebody is going to commit a major crime. Remember, if you try, if you don't try to do anything to stop a major crime, you are as, just as guilty as the person who commits it. That's not only through God's eyes, but a lot of times that's through obstructing justice. You can look up obstructing justice all you want, but that's the way it is. And that's the way Henry Ward Beecher felt about a lot of things. So, hopefully you learned something by all this. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them down here below. I will tell you more in a future video. Stay tuned.